Baldur's Gate 3 is a game filled with choices. Choices that have consequences. Just like what it's based off of. Dungeons and Dragons. At the heart of any unforgettable Dungeons and Dragons campaign is a great dungeon master. It's their responsibility that guides you on a grand adventure and make sure the world reacts to your actions in a way that feels natural and unplanned. It's collaborative storytelling between the players, the world, and the DM, orchestrated all so every action, choice, and consequence feels like it really matters. Now, that's tabletop D&D, but that sense of freedom and role-playing isn't that far removed from its video game counterpart, Baldur's Gate. The Boulders Gate franchise is built on capturing that tabletop playstyle, and Boulders Gate 3 is no exception, operating on D&D's latest 5th edition rule set. For developer Larian Studios to truly capture that D&D essence, it has to evoke that collaborative storytelling relationship between the player and the game. But somewhere early in the making of Bowler's Gate 3, the game's dungeon master made a very small decision that sent its development into a cascading spiral of problems that has been a big old challenge to solve. And all it involved was getting you, the player, to acquire one very specific item. This is a story about a literally insane amount of versions of the story of how you're going to get this bloody box. That is Sven. He's the dungeon master, or director, rather, of Boulder's Gate 3. Since he's not sitting across from you at a kitchen table for every roll of your dice, Sven and his team instead had to intricately design the game to account for every possible outcome, every possible choice you might make. I try to figure out for players interesting things to do, and then I try to predict how they're going to be doing them, as if they figured out a solution but I've prepared everything for them so that when they figure out their solution, uh, they get a reward that is better than what they expected. The solutions and rewards that Sven has created are referred to as permutations, the possible variations of a choice you make, the branching outcomes of chance and possibility, with every choice leading to other choices, most of which are determined by the roll of a dice. A small example would be, touch the brain, don't touch the brain, pull the brain out, try to kill the brain, fail at killing the brain. Now, you have to fight the brain. Two larger repercussions that can have a ripple effect down the line, like choosing to help someone, betray them, kill them, let them join your party, and so on and so forth. The choices you make are completely up to you because a good dungeon master never says no. It takes your choices and runs with it. Except in very, very rare occurrences, like when Sven decided you needed to have this box. Well, sort of a box. I keep on talk, calling it a box, but it really is an artifact. But we, it used to be a box. In the game, it's called a mysterious artifact, but yeah, it's, it's a box. It belongs to a character named Shadowheart. The box might be the key to the overall story, but it's also tied up in her story too. The artifact is being hunted and so I'm being hunted. And so, one way or another, you're going to need to get the box from Shadowheart. We very rarely have things that you must experience, but it's really important that you get this artifact. For Sven and his team, the objective became getting the player to receive this item as naturally and as elegantly as possible, without ever forcing the player to take it. It had to feel like it was the player's choice in order to maintain this idea of player freedom. At first, the possibilities to have this box come your way seemed pretty straightforward. An easy solution would be to just position Shadowheart in several places that the player could potentially run into her. One point in the tutorial area of the Nordaloid, and if not there, then there's a chance to cross paths with her on the beach, and if not there, then there's a chance to cross paths with her at Druid's Grove, and so on and so on. I was starting to think I was the only survivor. It started with very basic permutations. A, you invite her to your party. Great, problem solved, you have the box. It is in your party. Right then, lead on. B, you can kill her. <laughs> Take the box, morally wishy-washy, but hey, you still got the box, way to go. But what if you don't meet her? What if you walk past her? You don't talk to her, and if you do, you don't invite her to your party. What if you choose to jump off a ledge and injure yourself rather than cross paths with her? What if you just don't like her and want nothing to do with her? So they started working on ways to entice the player, like making it very obvious Shadowheart has an item of importance while shrouding it in mystery. There's no story. None that you're entitled to hear, anyway. Just 
Forget you ever saw it. But what if that wasn't enough? Here's one way to think about it. Imagine playing The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and just never picking up the ocarina. Or just avoid meeting Zelda altogether. And yet, the game continues on. The box in Baldur's Gate 3 is what the ocarina and Zelda are to Ocarina of Time. The simple task of enticing the player with not only the box, but the character Shadowheart started to completely unravel. It led to what Sven refers to as permutation insanity. Our entire design is built around your ability to recover from a catastrophe by doing things that the game allows you to do. And the box is a good example of that because it, uh, it involves just a couple of mechanics. You can kill her, you can steal from her, and you can move the objects. And these three things in the hands of a, a devious player cause a tremendous amount of permutations that we need to cover. Between the tutorial and the opening area, permutations to meet Shadowheart and receive the box are in the dozens alone. It only gets more complicated as the story goes forward. All of these possibilities need to be written, voice acted, animated, and scripted. Scenarios that included Shadowheart or didn't. There's somebody who has to write all of this dialogue. His name is John. And he just keeps on asking questions about the box. Well, what in this case? And what in this case? And the case is just kept on adding and adding and adding and adding and adding. I was like, oh my God, no, it comes from the sky. It falls on your head. I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. But it's too late now. You need to get the box and Shadowheart, she cannot live without the box. So the box has to be there. There's now hundreds of permutations in the game, with some more elegant than others. You may find yourself playing BG3 in very rare permutations where suddenly you're going to fall on your knees and you're going to need that box and Shadowheart is going to pop up. I'm here with the box in my hand. Use this box to protect you. And you say, who the hell are you? I followed you and I saw you. So it's a really ridiculous dialogue that really doesn't make that much sense, but it works. I mean, somehow, and you, you, it's a very confusing moment. So it might still change, but at this moment, that's the best that we have. You were lucky I managed to catch up with you when I did. We're both lucky, in fact. All things considered, Sven never went against the principles of a good dungeon master. In his design, he never wanted to say no to the player, to give you all this freedom and then snatch it away with a bottleneck that forces the item onto you. Like a good DM, he's not railroading you down a specific path but that isn't without a great deal of hardship in having integrity in the game's design. I feel shame <laughs> because I couldn't come up with something better. I mean, like, because this one is really my doing, it's not the team. Like, I was the one, that, the idiot that came up with this thing with the box doing it and, and giving it to Shadowheart. I know my intentions were noble, but my, my, my design was flawed. <laughs> It's permutation insanity. As of this video, Baldur's Gate 3 is still in development, but available to play in early access, which means the box problem isn't completely solved yet. How many actual man hours do you think uh, have gone into this? In the box? I don't want to know. I don't want to know how much man hours went into it because the pipeline that's behind these things is really big. It's the, it's the scripting and the writing, but then there's the voice recording, there's the cinematic design, the lighting, the VFX, the SFX, everything that goes with it, cinematic animation, motion capture, cleaning. I think if they're going to add up everything, it's going to be quite a few man months, if not man year, uh, just because of flawed design. Some games are set paths, stories meant to be experienced as the creator had intended, while other games invite you to craft the story with it. But in doing so, a lot of responsibility is put on the makers to make sure you feel that sense of agency in a story that really has already been meticulously laid out for you. Or you can just meet Shadowheart in the opening 15 minutes of the game, see the box, eventually invite her to your party, and just never wonder for a second that there was any other possibility, let alone hundreds. It was a very small thing that we just wanted her to, to give you the box. 